Yeah. So my name's Kathy, and it's great to have you here today, Deborah. And Thank but you. before I introduce you, I'd just like to recognise the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I admire their resilience and the strength of their culture and how they care for their land. And I extend those respects to anybody of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us here today. Deborah is joining us from her home in Mexico. Um, you may know some of Deborah's books, including The Little Coffee Shop in Kabul, Return to the Little Coffee Shop in Kabul, The Island on the Edge of the World, and The Zanzibar Wife. Um, the Moroccan, uh, they are all stories about exotic locations or different locations if you'd like to know and have strong female characters as the core of the book so I'm very excited to have a chat with Deborah about her books and um and and her writing process so welcome Deborah thank you thank you thank you I'm so I'm really happy to be here <laughs> I am super happy that you're here and I'm so glad that everybody um, was really patient with us so so we got um, we got this on the on the go. So firstly we've been having a little bit of a chat about about your book and there's I think one or two people who've read it and um, some who haven't. So could you give us a little bit of an idea about what the book's about? Well the Moroccan daughter obviously takes place in Morocco. But it's about forbidden love, uh, the clash of cultures, family relationships. Uh, it's a lot about secrets, uh, those who keep them, those who share them, those who have them. Uh, and it all takes place in this beautiful backdrop uh, in the Medina in Fez, Morocco, or in and in uh, the mountains in the Atlas Mountains, and it's it's such a beautiful backdrop for such amazing stories. Oh, you summed it up so nicely. Um, <laughs> you you really did, and and it is a beautiful story. Um, so your characters, I thought maybe there's four very strong char female characters in the book, or, or four female characters. I, I think they're all strong in their own different ways. Um, do you think you could use three words to describe each of the characters? Uh, B, my favourite, right? Uh, yeah, I love her. <laughs> funny, uh, eccentric, bohemian, and, well, that's three. I'm going to go with four, and wise. Oh, wise. I like that one. Yeah. And Carly is, sometimes I think Charlie is troubled, um, an adventurer, and um, resilient. Amina, how would you describe Amina? Amina? is conflicted. Um, uh, she's torn and she's, oh my goodness, I would think she's, I, it's not a word, but it would be uh, believes in love, uh, a believer, I guess. A romantic. Um, yeah, a romantic. <laughs> <laughs> but not your socky pink flowers kind of romantic. But right, so, right. Yeah. 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 Oh, I like that. Um, and who have we got left? Um, Samira. Samira is strong, a forceful and soft, uh, tender, tender. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with all of those because when I, I thought of this question, I thought, how would I describe um, Charlie? I actually found quite hard to describe. So I put her as mysterious because you don't really know her that well and she has a few secrets and things, but very right. loyal and very direct. Yeah, you know, and Charlie, uh, you can get to know better with Island on the Edge of the World, because that's where Charlie's introduced, because Charlie has this very uh, difficult and almost traumatizing backstory. 
that uh, was touched on in the Moroccan do- daughter, but basically the story that her story is island on the edge of the world and i mean she has she's gone through a lot yeah you you can kind of glean that from the moroccan daughter but yeah obviously if you haven't read it it's kind of like she's a bit mysterious it all make it makes me want to go and read that book to find yeah. out what it was that made her like that and um i yeah i found that she was very hard to pin down as a certain kind of she stereotype. Can almost, she can come off almost as coarse or hard. Uh, she's like not this warm fuzzy, right? Yeah. But she's protecting herself. I think it's she has that layer of protection for those you know, people who've been hurt often have that I'm not going to let you in so easy that's Charlotte yeah you got to work work for her friendship but I think she's I think she's very loyal um and in terms of Samira I agree she's very strong she's also very brave um there's a scene I saw where she has um she confronts the um Amina's father and I think I'm just there going, you go, girl. Like, that is amazing. Yeah, what right. absolute um, bravery that that is and absolutely I'm amazing character. <laughs> um, I'm just going to have a look and see. So we do have the focus on the women. It is very much a story of Amina, her marriage, her sister's marriage, um, you know, ha- her legacy, her heritage, um, but it's also got some quite interesting male characters in it that don't necessarily behave the way that Amina expects them to behave or the way that even the reader expects them to behave. Right. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about Max? And I don't know how to pronounce her father's name <laughs> and Tarek, her brother. Is it Haj? Haji. 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 Uh, uh, you- Haj, yeah, uh, it's kind of a, um, that's kind of often a nickname that they give people who've done the pilgrimage to Mecca. Okay. So, yeah, so it's kind of a nickname. So, okay, so Max, you know, Max, Max is kind of, you know, sometimes I think about Max and when I when I think of him in, you know, when I'm visualizing him, I almost see him a little bit like um, that a really smart, almost uh, Southern California guy, right? But with this, br- he's brilliant, but yet that kind of laid back, tossed hair and casual. I I go to San Diego a lot. He reminds me of San Diego, right? The surfer guys and they be they'll be coming there with their suit and tie, take it off and get into the waves. It kind of Max reminds me, I think of that when I think of Max. And so and he he's very he, he's in tune with the culture, but this whole thing with Amina surprised him, right? Um, having to be almost like she's two people, right? It's just, there's two Aminas, the, the one in the United States and the one in Morocco, which is very confusing to Max. Definitely, definitely confusing. Yeah. And, but he is such a, he's a likable character. And when, um, you know, when it comes down to the crunch, he, he does come across as very easygoing and everything like that. But he is so totally in love with his wife that, you know, he travels halfway across the world to, to see her and support her at a difficult time. And, and he wants to be involved, but I'm, I'm, I agree the culture shock is probably very, very huge for him. Yeah, yeah. And And having never been to Morocco, um, someone was describing, I think Susan was describing it before, and um, it is very, very different to anything that I've ever experienced. So um, 
I would imagine that Max, that's the viewpoint you've given Max. Right. Yeah. And, you know, Max is, Max is, understands the cultures, but there's no way that he could, was prepared for who he married to like cower. Like he'd never expected Amina, the strong woman, to cower in the face of her father and the family. Exactly, because Amina does come across as very modern in some respects, but in some respects, she's very traditional as well, right. too. So exactly. that's that conflict that you were describing. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's just lovely to see how the, the characters interact in the, the different locations. So Haji um, is another person that kind of took me by surprise. Um, I thought that he was, you know, this hard, tough, a bit like how Amina sees him as this authority figure and he's very strict and you know very tough and she doesn't quite fit in with the family and I I was pleased to see he kind of redeems himself a little bit yeah I, I you know that felt I mean that's his daughter and when I was in Morocco I talked a lot to the Moroccans on would this happen? Would he redeem himself? Or would he just say, this is the way it is? And it was it was mixed. It was like, oh no, that would he would never, never. And then others would say, you know, I believe that if he's an educated man, he will redeem himself. So it was really interesting to hear telling, you know, hear this from the Moroccans on could this happen? Because that was really crucial. Yeah, it's it's a really big part of the story and I'm very conscious of not um not giving away too many spoilers as as we go (laughs) um so and this so just mute me if I start (laughs) just don't listen if um if we start just brush over that bit um but Tarek Tarek yeah Tarek um Amina's brother is also another interesting male character in terms of he is showing us the modern Morocco and he too has a different side of him when you get to know him right Tariq is such, you know, he's the player, right? He he is um, all things that the boys have so much freedom. And he is the son. He gets to do whatever he wants. He doesn't have to worry about his virginity or any of this stuff. What he does is accepted and there's two sets of rules, right? And so, um, but Tariq, he, it's again, this, the conversation was, would, what would a brother do in this situation? Would a brother accept this? Or would the brother disown her? And the whole, the, in these conversations that I was having with the Moroccans, um, is it was basically about education it's like you know and how it's tough it's tough for a a brother and a father to accept the situation we're gonna we can't talk about (laughs) (laughs) yes (laughs) so I I yeah I really liked the way that those characters developed that depth as as they went through. But I have to ask, why did you choose Morocco as the setting for this story? I I love, first of all, I absolutely love Morocco. I love everything about Morocco. Um, I, I, the first time I was there, I, I went there a long time ago, like in the 90s. Then I went back again in um, like 2008 or nine. And I had just come back from Afghanistan I'd been back about a year, I think. And um, I felt lost in the States a bit like how uh, Amina or Charlie 
feels kind of out of sorts with where they're at. I think that's probably why I have a character like Charlie. Uh, and I felt so out of sorts going from living in Afghanistan to living in Napa Valley, California. I just could not wrap my head around any of it. And um, when I went to Morocco, it was for the first time in quite a long time, I felt um, like I had I'd come home. And so I always wanted to write a book that was uh, set in Morocco because I thought it would just be, you know, a stunning location and just amazing on every level. And so, yeah. And so it's just because I'm absolutely in love with Morocco. And it shows. And I like how you use that these um, poor eyesight is a right. method for you to describe the beautiful um, countryside and the different things that they're seeing as they go through. Is it the Medina? Medina. Yeah, so they go through the Medina and all the different sights and the smells and everything is described beautifully. And then they go up the mountain to the wedding festival. Have you ever been to a wedding festival? Because you describe it. Um, I was really at the well. wedding festival. It was insanity. It was it was the craziest thing I had ever experienced in my life. And yeah. I've traveled a lot, right? Uh, wow, this was, um, it was so interesting because I was trying to figure out whether I could have this book take place in Morocco or not. And I, I'll, I always like to have two locations, one, the main location, and then the secondary location. And um, so I'm just thinking, I, you know, I don't know. I don't really want it to be in Marrakesh because that's just another big city and then I I came upon the 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 wedding festival and I thought oh my goodness it has the whole Romeo and Juliet story people from all over the mountains from come in from all the villages so that they can the girls and boys can find can choose their own partner their own husband their own wife I thought I love that. I thought, I'm in. That's it. And so, yeah, I went. I'm really glad that I went. I was there in 2019. I'm really glad I wasn't there. Well, during COVID, like it was so crowded. And I, I look back at the pictures thinking, oh, my goodness, that's really weird, right? Thinking, I mean, I would probably be wearing a mask if I go back. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we, we get that though, when you look back at footage from um, a few years ago, of anywhere really, it's like, oh my God, don't hug. Don't, don't shake hands. Um, <laughs> we get all of that. We were so jammed in. It was so crowded that everybody was touchy. Like you're trying to maneuver. It was so crowded, so crowded. The more, and it was all young people coming in to find, you know, to, they were, you know, it's kind of like uh, back when I, you might, you know how the malls, the kids would circle the mall. That's what they were doing. But at this wedding festival, circling this giant flea market. Wow. And all I, all I can think of is the dust on their feet. And I, I, I can just imagine like you just taking off your sandals or whatever you're wearing and oh, there's just like I could just dust everywhere. On my teeth. I mean, there was dirt everywhere. Like I have uh pictures. It literally looks like uh one of those uh like a nuclear bomb had gone off or something. And this barren wasteland with a mother dragging her child and dust everywhere. I mean, I I looked at those pictures. I'm thinking, this just isn't inviting. <laughs> but no. it, I mean, that was just it was it was it was pretty barren and it was very 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 dusty. I had I had uh, closed-toed shoes. 
thank goodness my girlfriend who was with me had sandals. She literally, she was filthy, filthy. Like, oh. Uh, you are obviously like a well-seasoned traveler. How are you coping with not being able to travel the world and get locations for your books? Well, I, uh, I, it is kind of hard. Uh, I just booked, I just booked a trip to go to the States to get my shots. So that will be my first trip. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, yeah, I go back into the United States about every three months. But um, I'm looking forward to getting my shots and possibly being able to uh, scout some new locations. Yeah, yeah, because you've got you've got quite some um, some quite ones in your history as well too. So where we when you're able to travel again, where do you think that you would go? Well, the I'm the one. I mean, I really I what I want to do is I want to take my granddaughter to Morocco. Like I really want, she's young, she's like 10, but I really want her to see that. But before that happens, I I have a story in mind and I was thinking possibly it could take place in Colombia. And so I want to get to Colombia and check it out. Uh, I, I mean, I'll look forward to reading any of your books. So <laughs> wherever they're set, they can be set in Mexico or the US, I'll read them. Um, so one thing I noticed in the, the back of the book talking about culture is you have recipes in the back um, yes. from, from Morocco and I'm dying to try some, but I have to go to the shops and get ingredients like semolina and, and things like right. that. Have you cooked many of these? Okay. So first of all, I can't cook at all I can bake and so I when I go to uh back to the states in um uh in May actually I'm I want to make the cookies yes 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 but I can't get the ingredients for the cookies here oh so, really yeah so that's on like I have my list of things I have to bring back to Mexico because yes I those cookies oh my goodness I oh, lived goodness. on the cookies I lived on them and I have to admit when we were, when I saw these I went oh the cookies are oh, the ones that I'm going to have to just make dissolve in your mouth I was like <laughs> I am hungry thinking about it I, I get I get migraine headaches from a lot of different foods and so sometimes I was I thought oh no I just don't even I'm, I don't want to get a migraine because i had been traveling and I'll get a, a headache from like the flights and stuff like that. But the cookies, every time I was fine, like I could, so I lived on the cookie every day, like with the mint tea, it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, th I think I could do that as well too. So for those who haven't got the book in front of them, the cookies that we're talking about are Moroccan coconut cookies and they oh. do have semolina in them and orange blossom water. So it's the orange blossom water and the semolina, which I'm going to have to go and, and yeah, find I, in the shop. buy orange blossom water. <laughs> like, I don't know where I'll buy them. <laughs> you can make this orange blossom water. That's going to be pretty heavy to carry in my suitcase. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I, I think I need to investigate that further so I can get yeah, the cookies gonna, made. But if, you, if anybody uh, figures out how to do that, I need them to let me know. Okay, uh, I'll see what I can do. And if anybody yeah. knows how to make orange blossom water or where you can buy it, I, I would imagine somewhere like a health food shop may, may sell it. But um, it would be really great to try these cookies because I'm dying right. to try them. Your writing process, how do you, you've switched from careers, you've switched from hairdressing to... Oh, I'm still a hairdresser. You're still, still hairdresser? a hairdresser? Okay. Absolutely. Always a hairdresser. And you have your tippy toes beauty salon yeah. there in Mexico. And but writing, how did you do the the move sort of, sort of like how did you get into writing? Um I always wrote. Um uh, I wrote uh one act plays, yeah, from long, long, long time ago. Uh I wrote what I would write like sketches. Um, you know, I did the typical journaling and that sort of thing, but um, 
I, I think that for me, I have, I, it's really weird. I never saw myself as a writer. I always saw myself as a storyteller. That was my thing. And it's like, I'm telling stories. And so I was always able to tell a story in a one act play or in a sketch, or I was always as a hairdresser, constantly telling stories constantly. And so I, it was just something that just evolved that way. And so I think for me being the hairdressing part has been what has made the storytelling very natural for me. Yeah, I do like going to the hairdressers and having a good chat while, while I'm there. Hairdressers seem to be the best storytellers um, and all while maintaining their client confidentiality as well too. So, right, right. Yes. It's, the dome, <laughs> it's the dome of silence. <laughs> yeah, I just love the hairdressers. So, um, okay, what else have we got? Oh, one, one thing I really wanted to find out more about was Oasis Rescue and Project Mara, Mariposa. Mariposa. Yes. Yes. So Oasis Rescue is a nonprofit that I started when I was doing um, the uh, beauty school in Afghanistan. So when I wasn't doing that anymore, I still wanted to continue in that industry and, you know, uh, being able to support the girls to uh, learn hairdressing or the spa services. So I started to um, do what's called beauty shop in a box. So I, I sent a lot of boxes to like a lot of war zone places, Iraq, Syria. I sent boxes there and, um, and, and to Afghanistan when I was back in the States. And so, um, oh, somebody says, is telling where the orange blossom water is. <gasps> Thank you. <laughs> it's like, what? Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, then when I, I came to Mexico, I realized that I still wanted to do the same thing, but I wanted to do it differently. I didn't want to have a school. I didn't need to do beauty shop in a box because we could get everything here. And so uh, I would just give scholarships to girls. Um, for I, I learned that uh, the girls that really needed to have a quick education, so to speak, um, sometimes a two-year program, they really stretch it out here terribly in, um, in, in the town I'm in. And so we would give them, um, you know, okay, let's go for nails or let's go for massage, or let's do, do facials. And so we would just send them to little segments and found really good results with that. Then I also have all my uh, in-house training for all my staff. Um, so we've had, we've trained a lot of, lot of girls. And it's, it's a very worthwhile thing to do. And it's something I never even considered as, um, an option or a need in those countries where you, you know, you need that education. But w why wouldn't you want to? I mean, you've only got to look at the Moroccan daughter to see the the elaborate um, wedding preparations that that go into there. Is that you need these skilled workers um, yeah. in in, in those locations? Arabic, Indian, uh, Pakistan, uh, you know, Central Asia. They're all. They all are very glammed up for their weddings and parties and stuff like that. That they're very their make hair and makeup are very strong in their cultures. Yes, and um, I just think of the the difference from the start of the book where you've got um, Amina wanting to do her hair and have it straightened, and Charlie's going, "No, no, no, I'm not going to do it." This is when they're in the states, and then they go over there, and it turns out she does have her hair traditionally done, and it's it's amazing, and it's a one off kind of thing. It's not totally, yeah. you know, the rest of her life. Um, so. Where do you see yourself going from here in terms of your charity work? Is there more things that you'd like to do in the future? You know, I really like what I'm doing right now because 
I mean, we keep it simple, right? It's uh, a young girl, really targeting girls who are in need, right? Not, not like I had, I had a young girl that was actually working for me. She was from a, uh, and we taught her how to do manicures and pedicures. And, uh, but she said, I really, really want to be a makeup artist. Like she, and she was from an exceptionally poor background. And although she was working, she still had to help pay for all her whole family. So it was, was a really hard thing. And so I said, well, fine, we'll, we'll, I'm going to let you send you to school for make. We don't do makeup at my salon. We don't do the wedding hair and all that. And so I says, okay. And she did quit and she has a job as what she wants to do, a makeup artist. So I was really happy. And so she's able to make extra money doing weddings. I mean, she's excellent at what she does, but it's, it's that simple. It's simple. It's just, as easy as that. Yeah. And I, I think that if she's where she wants to be and you've helped right. her, I mean, that's one one person is, is saved yeah. from, I mean, it's, yeah. It's really important to, um, to just meet them where they're at right there, right, versus trying to make it so huge. Uh, you know, I found I have – found that I would say, okay, let's go to beauty school. But they would never finish because it was a very, they needed money. They need money. They need to learn how to do something quickly and make money so they can help their family or feed their children. Yeah, it's very different for us signing up for like a three-year university um, or TAFE, um, which is um, community college kind of thing. Um, it's very different for us to do that because we have a different support system here in Australia. So um, I I would imagine that it would be very challenging for them to get that time out of work and things to do it. Mm. You know, and I, and I was very interesting at the beauty schools, they would put the beauty schools, they would, you would only go to school like three hours a day. So it dragged out forever. I'm thinking I really wanted to put my own beauty school in and like get this thing going faster. <laughs> but I did not. I held back. <laughs> One day. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> that, is not in my, that is not a goal. <laughs> um. Before we before we kind of finish up our little chat, would you like to read a section of the Moroccan Daughter for us? Oh goodness, I didn't even pick anything. I don't have anything prepared. Let's see. Oh. I I I'm gonna have to say I don't have anything. Even that's if it's terrible. well, that's all right. You can read. You have something. <laughs> <laughs> Let me let me see. Um, normally, you know what the one that I would read, but I don't know where it is, is the the um, be in the in the hammam. Oh, I don't know that one. I know. Oh, it's so funny, but I'd have to look for it. I was not ready for this. Sorry. That's okay, because um, you've just reminded me. Yes, that the um the witchcraft and the um, things that the the shop that they go to to get help for different issues it's kind of it's not really a doctor's it's more like a a witch herbalist herbalist. (laughs) (laughs) a herbalist um did you get to visit one of those because it sounds amazing yeah 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 It it was weird on every level and fun. But the one story that is really interesting is, so B is blind, right? Or bare, mostly blind. And so um, I always have a research partner that I, I travel with to do all the research for the books. And so it's really important that I, 
walk in my character's footsteps, so to speak. So the Riyadh or the palatial house that the family lived in, I needed to rent one of those. So I, I, I rented this giant uh, Riyadh so that I could stay in it with my research partner and maybe a girlfriend or two or whatever. And uh, at the last minute, like 10 days prior to going to Morocco, um, she had a family emergency and couldn't go. And I'm thinking there, I, I had heard the Riyadh's, I had somehow in my research, I heard the word haunted. And I'm thinking, okay, okay, I cannot be in this Medina in a haunted house trying to do research by myself. I, I had anxiety. There's no amount of, of those cookies that would have calmed my nerves. I would have seen ghosts around every corner. So I put out an SOS to my girlfriend. And so my girlfriend, Linda, uh, joined me. And she was, she had just come off knee surgery. And so she was about six weeks out of surgery. So when we walked into the into the gates of the Medina, and there's 9,000 little alleyways and pathways that there's no cars, it's donkeys, it's uh, little wheelbarrows. I mean, it's really chaotic. And, and it's this medieval city, working city, this ancient city. And I mean, we're, I'm thinking, what have I done? As soon as I walked in, we're being pressed up against the wall because a donkey is coming by. And there was people walking with this giant uh, panel, uh, pane of glass, huge pane of glass. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, these never gonna make it in here. What was I thinking? How could I have brought B, who can't see, to Morocco? What is she going to do? And then my, we get, we walk about 30 minutes, 40 minutes into the Medina, deep into the Medina to our, our Riyadh. We get there and I'm huffing and puffing. There's somebody lugging our luggage. And we get there and Linda's knee was about this big. Oh. And she sits down and she says, I said, I says, I don't, she goes, I don't know how I'm going to make it, you know, here. I says, I don't know how you're going to make it. I don't know how B's going to make it. Like, it just seemed like this huge problem. And this, the, the manager, the Riyadh, he says, oh, don't worry. And in he comes about 15 minutes later with this very, very handsome man and a wheelchair so we were able to throw linda in the wheelchair and i says close your eyes close your eyes i want you to tell me everything you hear everything you smell and so i think that's one reason that bees you you really get a sense of the the medina from bees perspective because we were I was able to have it from Linda's perspective of everything. It, it brought so much to life. And then I could sit in the wheelchair and sneak a ride and close my eyes. And what a different world, a completely different world. So that was the research process was amazing that way. Changed the book completely for us. And that, that is one of my highlights of the book is the descriptions that come through B as the character. Yeah. Um, I really, really love those descriptions. And it took me to Morocco and I've never been and I would love to go. So right. hurry up and everyone get, get this COVID out of the way so we can do a little bit more travelling. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I just want to extend a really, really, really big thank you for, for joining us. Sorry, we've got the times all, all muddled up for you, but um, we really appreciate you jumping on um, a little bit earlier for us. And we wish you all the best with this beautiful book, The Moroccan Daughter, I just have to say. Um, 
this is my little book review for you. I found the book to be warm and engaging, enlightening about the Moroccan culture and all about family, however different they may be. It's a perfect for escaping to an exotic location on a windy, rainy indoor day. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for your time and thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.